Hello and welcome to the Modern Fairy Sightings podcast, where we listen to people's fairy encounters. But take heed, we're not talking about winged tinkerbells here. These are real fairies, real encounters that took people like you and I by surprise. Stay a while and hear their stories. My name is Joe Hickey Hall and I'm a folklore researcher. Hello dear listener, how are you? While the external world continues to be a difficult place to be, many of us are simultaneously choosing to dream into being another way to live and furthering our understandings of this mysterious universe. This episode is a beautiful, soothing offering of one man's relationship with nature. In times of great difficulty, there is always solace in communing with nature in any way that feels right to you. Walks in your local park, venturing out into your garden in the evening, visiting a special place that holds meaning for you. There will always be a place that you're drawn to and trust that whim and explore it. Firstly, I want to thank my amazing supporters on Patreon, The Curious Crew, for supporting this project. Without their support, I would not be able to make these episodes, so I am ever grateful for their belief in what I'm creating. A special shout out to Paul, V, EB, Jane and Stephen, who have joined on the Weird Folk, Curious Enchanter and Shining Ones tiers. Thank you. And I'm working on some extra special episodes for these tiers at the moment. There are many more folk joining us all the time, and for the moment, at least, there's a free seven-day trial. So, if there's an episode that particularly interested you, there'll be a bonus exclusive part to go with it that you can find there. The guest from this episode has agreed to come on and do a Q&A with the Curious Crew in the coming months, as I felt he really had a lot to impart about the way he's living his life. I also want to mention that the response to this podcast on the YouTube channel version of this podcast has been immense. That's Modern Fairy Sightings on YouTube. Many more people are discovering these stories for the first time, and I would urge listeners to go and read the comments. Individuals are sharing their stories, and it's so wonderful. I have said before, and I'll say it again, that these encounters are not rare, and I'd go as far as suggesting that every one of us knows someone who's seen a fairy. Again, we're not trying to convince people of the existence of fairies. Those who have seen them know that they exist, and we simply want to share these stories with each other. If you hop onto YouTube, please subscribe and share with friends who might enjoy watching the video interviews. And please, as always, share these audio episodes with people who need to hear them. There have been a number of touching responses from the last episode with Amanda Mariamne Radcliffe, which I've very much enjoyed reading, and I've sent them on to her too. Some people wrote in with their own experiences of the lady. There also seems to be something about this time, and the remembrance of the great suffering of the Cathars. Perhaps it's because, as we are currently witnessing a transition from one age to another, we sense that the the Cathars story is a reminder to us of the countless cycles of humanity and the scenarios that play out between human beings and a small minority's need to dictate what people should and shouldn't believe. In any case, I can say that many of you found that episode particularly moving for your own reasons. If you have a story of your own, you can contact me at scarletofthefay at gmail.com. I also offer healing appointments when I get time and you can find details of that at scarletofthefay.com. In the bonus episode, I share some similar accounts with what appear to be tree folk or some kind of shape-shifting gnomes that closely associate with trees. I hope you enjoy this episode as, for me, it encapsulates the sort of reciprocal relationship that we can develop with a natural environment. Further on in the episode, our guest recalls an outing to another location where he sensed danger and a strong message that he should leave immediately. Many of us have felt these instinctive messages when out in the wilds. Now, I just want to add a quick word about mushrooms. So I don't advise anybody to go mushroom hunting 
uh, if you, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, go with somebody that is a professional that can ID correctly, an actual professionally qualified person. One of the mushrooms that Paul described was like a fly agaric, but um, brown. Now, I mentioned I thought that these might be poisonous when we had our kind of bonus chat at the end. These mushrooms are called, if they are these ones, they're called panther caps. They look just like fly garricks, the ones that you see in all the storybooks, the beautiful red with the white uh, spots on, except they're brown. If they are panther caps, Amanita pantherina, these are poisonous. They have similar toxins to fly agaric and it can be fatal in rare cases. So I wanted to make that clear that some mushrooms are poisonous and don't just go picking mushrooms willy-nilly because some of them can kill and you need to know what you are doing. It is not worth taking a chance. Enjoy. Time to Welcome to the Modern Fairy Sightings podcast and I'm here this time with Paul from Alberta, Canada who describes himself as a nature enthusiast. We've just had a wonderful chat about Paul's garden and cats and our ever ever kind of worrying situation, well my worrying situation with having a cat and then you know being worried about the wildlife because our cat goes outside anyway welcome Paul and thank Thank you you. for joining me yeah no I'm really excited to be here and uh talk to like-minded people about uh our experiences yeah this is it because you contacted me some time ago and we were talking about an experience that you'd had which as I've just we've just been sort of chatting uh beforehand is very close to my heart because the, the type of being without saying too much about it at the moment the type of being that you saw is something that I also saw quite a number of years ago now and I've spoken to other people who've seen these beings and I'm particularly interested in these beings but you've had a number of lovely experiences so yeah just start wherever you like by um, telling us what you'd like to about the encounters that you'd had. Absolutely. So uh, I guess the main story here is uh, the being that I've seen. Um, to give a little background, the place where we saw it uh, is in Alberta, near an area called Pigeon Lake. So a lot of sand hills, a lot of wetlands around that area. And this was a campground that we actually found by mistake because I had booked a campground somewhere else, but on the wrong day. And it was the day of, and I was frantically trying to find a place where we could go, you know, put up a tent, just spend the weekend outdoors. And I came across this uh, place that uh, was amazing. We got there and it's just, it was in the middle of a a forest, lots of birch trees everywhere, a little bit of um, evergreen, but mostly birch and poplar. And this area was actually really nice because um, a forest fire had gone through at some point and it has since regrown in, but there was a lot of wetlands surrounding it. So all the forest floor was covered with just moss and mushrooms and beautiful like birch trees golden in the fall so we were there in the summer and we were amazed by it we go into the back trails and there's these little trails all along and there's mounds uh, that look like little houses all over the place just covered in moss sticks and logs everywhere like when you think of an enchanted forest this was it um just beautiful especially when the sunlight would come through so we're like we have to come back to this place and around this time this was I'd say I think maybe like five years ago maybe more uh, I was just really getting into more of a uh, I guess a pagan side of things more of a magical side looking into that just thinking about uh, the seasons and energies and all this good stuff Um, so we were talking when we're walking and we're talking about uh, my wife had heard a story about someone um called out to like the fae to the fairies and asked for I think it was a a bird bone or something and he was presented with it and the story was kind of talking about you know 
he didn't take it, I think was what it was. And then bad stuff happened to him, oh. essentially, where he asked for something, he was given this gift, and then he refused it. Um, and so we were just talking about, you know, how, yeah, maybe you shouldn't kind of mess around with that stuff. And it was around that same time while we're walking on this path, on one of these mossy uh, mounds, there was a deer jawbone, perfectly like picked clean this bone. You know, someone put it there. We just thought the timing was interesting. Uh, it just added to the 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 feeling of this place. So we knew we were going to come back, and we did that same year. Uh, Mabon is very special to us, the autumn equinox. It's one of my most important times of the year. Uh, you know, it's really all just about the uh, the energy going back into the earth. We're moving into that time of giving back, uh, and it it always just feels uh, extra magical to me. So this place also had these cabins. So we, a little cabin that had a wood burning stove, a bed, and that was all that was in there. Uh, but it was great. So the night was coming up and I wanted to do something called an apple rite that I actually do every year. This as well. Um, you take an apple and you, when you cut the apple in half, the, the seeds naturally form that five pointed star. And from it, I just talk about, you know, the five directions and how the fifth direction is where we are. And the fifth element is our spirit. And it just kind of like a little, um, a little ritual we do every year now. Well, I had been new into this stuff and I hadn't quite learned yet that if you go into a really energetic place, a really magical place, and you start just throwing your own stuff around, your own energy without asking permission first, well, maybe things won't always go right. So we we did our, you know, we had some drinks, we did our our ritual. And then as it was getting darker, like basically my wife got panic attacks. I was getting anxious because of it. It was a really, uh, really long night. And we felt like this almost like uh, oppressing force. Um, like, and I felt like, hey, I think I messed up bad here. Um, and so the night, it eventually calmed down. And I apologized to the area. And then after that, everything was much, much lighter. Um, this place, it felt very welcoming. When we would go on in the trails, there'd be tons of mushrooms everywhere. Like it was one of our favorite things to do is on the bond, we go mushroom foraging. It's a, a joy that we get to do. So this place was really special to us and we'd go back a lot. And then unfortunately it became under uh, new management and it just didn't, jive um there was a lot of residents that had kind of leased out locations for rvs there and it was a very um it was a friendly so it was an lgbtq friendly area um and these new owners came in and pretty much they raised all the lease amounts everyone moved out they they were really just not quite our people they got rid of the camp spots because they said you can't trust campers so we unfortunately knew we probably shouldn't come back to this place. And it was heartbreaking. So we knew this was going to be our last time there. And it was on this last time, uh, I'm a bon, when I had my sighting, my encounter. And we had other, other things happen before too. Like it was the first and only time we ever saw fireflies was at this location. Like we don't really get them around here a lot. And so that was really magical. So it was this last time uh, we went on a few walks and I decided to go on one my by myself because the presence I often felt there was like really strong similar to how I mentioned like my cat's presence she's you know she's just she's all about me um it felt almost like intimate sometimes this yeah. presence I would feel when I was there and it was calming and it was nice and alluring at different times and so I went on this last walk on my own and I was I was starting to feel it again and you know how when you get like the hairs on the back of your neck, like that feeling, like when you can just tell something's going on. And along the perimeter of the forest, if you look, you can see some farmer field and the sun was just coming up in the afternoon and I could see coyotes running along the perimeter. So, you know, they don't worry me too much, but it kind of had me on edge. So I was just trying to enjoy myself and I kept hearing creaks and cracks around me in the trees and I spend a lot of time in the woods. And so I often always on the lookout, especially when I go hiking in the mountains on my own, I'm always on the lookout for bears and all the fun little critters out there. So when I was feeling like this is feeling pretty intense, I turned around and maybe like 15 meters away, 
I saw what looked like a small person, like toddler size, uh, but they're made of like wood. And I had to like blink a little bit because I thought, you know, my eyes are just playing tricks on me. Like, what am I seeing? And it looked like it was behind a tree, like it was peeking out around this tree. It wasn't really moving when I saw it, but its head seemed disproportionately large mm -hmm. and really flat nose and almost no eyes. And as I was looking at it, I was asking myself, is am I actually seeing this or am I just seeing something that looks like this? And as I mentioned, I spend a lot of time uh, in the woods. I go hiking on my own a lot. And there's been a lot of times when I've seen things and I think it's a bear or I think it's a deer and it turns out to be nothing. Mm -hmm. But this wasn't fading. And it wasn't until I blinked again and I started to walk towards it that it seemed like it shifted and the light changed. And so I walked right up to it. And it, as I walked, it seemed like it just like turned into the tree Yeah, is the best way I can describe it. Mm. And so I looked at how the light was coming in. I thought maybe I was seeing just, you know, things lining up. So I walked back to where I was, but I couldn't see it anymore. And it didn't feel like I saw something that wasn't there. It was the, sh the, the shape of a person, like I said, except this disproportionate and it was all wood. And it yeah. seemed to just blend into the wood as soon as I noticed it and started to walk towards it. So it left me kind of uneasy because, you know, it's not something I was expecting to see. So I decided I would head out um, back to our campground. And as I was walking back uh, again, I got this feeling of something just kind of watching me and I was getting closer. And then I heard a snap in the uh, bushes beside me and a grouse comes flying out in front of me. And it goes off to my right. And as soon as I turn my head to the right, something goes crashing through the trees. It sounds like a deer. If you've ever heard a deer go yeah. skipping off the trees. But the trees are really narrow here. And when I was looking at it, like, I couldn't see any deer, but I could hear the crashing going off. Mm -hmm. So it sounded like something went running off into the trees. And I feel like maybe this grouse was trying to distract you. I don't know. It definitely seemed that way. And so by that point, I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm going out. I got back to the campsite and I like said to my wife, I'm like, I think I just saw a small person in the woods. And, you know, to this day, I even ask myself, was, was I just seeing, you know, am I just telling myself I saw it, but you know, it, it was real. Like I saw this, the face and everything like, yeah. and it really changed my outlook on so much of this stuff. Um, to just think that I might not know what it is I saw, but I saw something and I know it was connected to these energies of nature in the woods. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it had a message for you? What was the kind of feeling behind it when you met it? If it was only said it didn't really have eyes to speak of, but was it facing towards you? Do you feel like you were kind of facing each other in any way? Yeah, like it it looked like it was looking around the tree. Like it was definitely felt like it was connecting with me. And one of the, the only things I can think of is I felt like I did make a connection with some sort of energy in this place over the years I've been there. And, you know, I was saying goodbye to it and maybe it was saying goodbye to me. And it it's interesting. Uh, like I go out in the woods a lot and I don't usually take things from the woods very often. Mm -hmm. And if I do, um, I often think about it a lot before I do, I give an offering of tobacco. Um, but when we were going on one of the walks, there was a fallen birch tree and there is a, a, a tinder hoof. I actually have it right here still uh, a tinder hoof um, fungus. And as soon as I saw it, I went for it and I just grabbed it. I took it off the tree and I grabbed it. And it, even as I did that, I was like, that is very unlike me to do, but I felt like this wanted to be with me. And now I keep it here and it reminds me of, uh, you know, the spirit of this place that I spent a lot of magical times and had this encounter that honestly is going to stick with me for the rest of my life. Absolutely. That's so, that's quite an incredible piece there as well. I, I've never, uh, I actually never heard of tender hoof. I'm not very knowledgeable um, with fungus, and I really wish I was. I'm about to start a trial pack, in fact, um, to 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 grow to grow my own bits and pieces at home. Oh, nice! <laughs> and that would be my first introduction. 
Um, but that's, I mean, have you ever sat and uh, meditated with it to see if you can connect back in with the wood? Yeah, and actually there's a number of times when I'm sitting and just meditating, relaxing, I'll hold it. Uh, it feels like it fits so perfectly in my hands and just uh, the smoothness and the softness of it, just everything about it, its weight and its its solidness, like it just, it takes me right back to that place. And, mm. um, you know, when, when I was saying we joke about my cat being uh, a, a nature spirit turned into a cat, we often joke that perhaps that spirit followed me here because it was um, the October after that September that Marcy came into our life when she kind of just sprouted up under the most magical place in my yard. So oh, my goodness, that's a lovely thought to have. Yeah, absolutely. Because there are so many aspects to that story. The fact that I think, as you say, <clears throat> excuse me, our relationship with the landscape is so important and if we if we develop some kind of relationship with an environment it it definitely has um the potential to then leave a space for some kind of communion to take place i firmly believe that i've I've experienced that myself i see it in other people's experiences as well that there was some kind of relationship there Um, So we can either see these beings as the genius loci um, or just some kind of representation of nature in that place. And, you know, we can look at the fact that it was um, August. So again, kind of that liminal time slipping in from uh, summer into autumn. I always find that the equinox is a really potent time as well. Not just the festivals. People tend to think about the festivals like Beltane, Samhain. And yes, they are highly, highly powerful times of year. Um, But those equinoxes are equally, equally powerful uh so that's that's definitely a factor too and as you say kind of saying goodbye to this place that you really you really loved and appreciated Mm -hmm. it's sad to hear that um i mean what they're going to use it for these people what they so there's still it's unfortunate it it's a side effect of capitalism. Yeah. Um, they they came in, they wanted to get rid of the camping spots because they could charge more if they turned them into leased RV spots. They raised the, you know, the leasing uh, amounts. So essentially they just want to make more money. And mm-hmm. on this last time we were there, they were actually doing a lot of landscaping too. So it, it's my fear that they're going to dig in uh, and cut down more trees to try to make more space. And so that small little area that was just so uh, special and magical, I feel like they might start um, taking it over just to make more space, to make more money. And it it really is heartbreaking when you see that because my time there was almost like my, you know, awakening into this new phase in my life that I've been going through in the last five years or so. And I've always had a connection with nature. it's been in this last five years has been really my connection with plants has grown because when you look around, uh, even like in your background here, when you see all of these, this greenery and we see trees and so many times we, it, they just become objects to us. But when you take the time to look down and see, you know, every clump of this grass, every rhizome, it's a, a living being. There's plantain, there's these wildflowers, there's, you know, Labrador tea, you got mugwort, you got all these different things that are growing and existing, and they're all life forms. And when you start seeing in that way, uh, you really get this connection to it. And I think a lot of times when you have, you know, one of my best friends, he's a, he's a real skeptic. Uh, but when you close your mind off to things, it's like you're blinding yourself. And so I feel like if people connect with nature and a lot of times the best way to do that is through an act of reciprocation, you know, knowing what something is taking care of it, it takes care of you. Uh, When you make that connection, you'll start to see these things. You know, they say, if you want to see UFOs, just look up, Mm -hmm. you know, how often do we look up? Really? You want to find mushrooms? You got to look down. (laughs) And yeah, it's, I explained it to him. It's almost like, if you're listening to like any sort of music platform and they're making playlists and there's songs you've never heard before, but they're playing in the background and you don't really notice them, but maybe one day you pick up some lyrics from one of these songs you've always heard 
So you look into it and you're like, hey, these lyrics are actually quite meaningful to me. So then you start listening to the song more and maybe this thing that was always in the background, now it's become a song that like makes you feel things, makes you feel connected before it was nothing and now it's everything. And I think that's the same with uh, the world around us, especially with nature, all the bugs, all the mammals, all the birds, all the plants, the snails, just everything. When you start um, seeing them and knowing them, uh, you start seeing and knowing. Oh my goodness. Thank you. That's absolutely beautiful. And yes, and it, it kind of makes me feel sad that that we don't. I mean, I, th I think it's kind of improving. I know there's lots of I know of an amazing primary school teacher, Maz, if she's watching, I, you know, I love her very much. She, she does this, she brings nature in for the children and she teaches them and she's always done that. This is kind of like three, four year olds. Um, and there are lots and lots of teachers like that, but you're absolutely right. It, it's, it's, it's what, it's what we're about as human beings. And what you were saying about this reciprocal nature I, I totally agree. Um, I did go uh, fly garrick hunting with a friend of mine, Paolo, uh, Paolo, Paolo uh, Summit. And um, we went to this forest that's kind of, he lives slightly further away. So we, we kind of met met somewhere in this, this pine wood. And we were, um, we were walking around and, and we knew that there would be lots of, he'd been there before, I'd never been there before, but he knew there were lots of mushrooms there. Uh, and at one point, we went through a part of the wood that to me felt like a doorway. Um, it just had a, a sense to it. And I said, just hold here a second. Can we make an offering? I feel like this is a really special place that we're in right now. And, and I'd like to do a little no ritual here and and uh, give an offering and say thank you and so this is this is what we did and after because I, I poured a libation um and said a few words etc afterwards we suddenly looked around and there were all these mm. mushrooms there that we hadn't noticed before we left the offering <laughs> you know we'd stopped we were there we were kind of looking at the place and we didn't see them until you know so after that um you know, later on, we then found these massive, beautiful, the, the sort of fly garricks that you see in, in storybooks, just absolutely perfect, huge, big. Outstanding. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and so, you know, he brought a few of those home. But um, it, that, was, that was really noticeable to me what had happened there. And, and there's no, there's no um, mistaking it, really, that feeling. And I guess a bit like the feeling that you had when you had the the sounds in the forest, and then this um, the the pheasant. Did you say it was a pheasant appeared through? Um, it's it seemed like a it was a grouse <clears throat> or a pheasant. One of them it grouse, moved pretty yeah. quickly. We got a lot of grouse around here. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, for some people, and I know this was it was like this for me. Um, there's a kind of mischievous nature to fairies <laughs> and uh, after I saw my being that's what happened to us there was somebody in some I knew it was this being because you couldn't see anybody but it was this being to the left of us in the long grass walking at the same pace as us and when yes. my husband started picking up his pace it picked up its pace and then he started running <laughs> you know and this is the kind of thing it's it is quite cheeky it's very fairy energy as from my point yeah. of view anyway it feels like that to me um and wouldn't it be lovely if if this if this um fungus that you've brought home is your way of connecting back in um do you know what properties that fungus has what does it do for people in the body so i can't recall i think what it does for the body um i think it might have some antiseptic properties but uh, one of the reasons it's called tinder hoof is it looks like a hoof and it's great for fire starting in fact uh, if you're ever out in the woods and you really need some fire starter it grows on most birch trees and poplars and it is uh is a great source of fire starters so uh it gives us warmth and light <laughs> so yes. it's it's yeah, it uh, 
it definitely just, it really connects me to that area. And, you know, you, you talked about the mushrooms uh, only once we ever found fly garlic, it was a golden variety. So we've yet to find the red ones, but it was also on Mabon on when we had to find a new place. And uh, this place is really amazing. We found so many mushrooms there and, uh, you know, the thrill when you find them just walking through the forest and just, you know, the smells and the sound. And during the same time, we saw one of the largest uh, woodpeckers we've ever seen, uh, one of these plated ones. And it is just so magical. And I think that love that we have and that tradition and that ritual that we got from that place is something else that place gave to us that we've now taken uh, elsewhere and gets to constantly remind us of this energy that uh, bloomed within us. That is very much a gift. Yeah. And what a gift to have the gift of warmth and light when you're just going into the darker months as well. That's very fitting, I yes, think, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> Lovely. Now, yeah. there's <clears throat> it's when you mentioned about the uh, the cheekiness of them, um, of these fairy beings. So we had some ex some different things here at our house happen. And, you know, my son, uh, bless him, but one time he... I said he invited fairies into his room. He made a little bed for them and everything. And he put out, uh, I can't remember, some sort of treat for them. And I didn't even really realize this. And then I came across it one day and I was like, oh, what's this? And he's like, oh, it's for the fairies. And even a little sign for it. And I was like, oh, yeah, hey, that's that's cool and all. But you just got to be careful if you're inviting things into the house. So, you know, we had a few odd occurrences around the house but my wife experienced something very interesting when she was in his room uh she was grabbing something his bed's often a mess and his blanket was a mess and she said she saw something underneath the covers moving as if it was maybe like a mouse or something she stared at it for a while and she thought maybe it was the cat but she lifts the blankets and there's nothing there there's no mouse, no cat. So uh, something small was moving around in his bed and um, especially under his bed is where he said he made an area for them. And so we, uh, we, we asked politely if anything could you know, move, move to the garden, you know, move to the yeah. yard <laughs> and, um, you know, just odd things here and there. You know, some people might chalk it up to just, you know, randomness, maybe ghosts we had a whistle happen one time uh, my wife and me were sitting at the table and she was asking me oh you know how old is your mom turn this year and I said 70 and then from in between us I was like Whew! and we both heard it yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> had you heard had uh, you felt anything in the house before do you think it's to do with um you know, sometimes it's never been anything like malicious no, no, or no. angry. Um, I don't often feel uh, presences in the home here. Uh, it's actually been one of the only places I've ever lived where I didn't uh, feel strangeness. But uh, in the in in the back garden, in the backyard is where I definitely feel the most uh, magical things. But things go missing. Um, I've had pairs of pants go missing. <laughs> You know, I, I don't I don't put my clothes very many places. And yes, uh, I had a pair of pants go missing. Uh, we've had uh, different odds and ends. Um, my mandolin picks, they often go missing and then show up again. Uh, so whenever I'm getting low on them, I just kind of wait and they seem to show back up on my little shelf here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's just I think it's just energies. It's kind of everywhere. And it's that same kind of once you start noticing it and once you're open to it, uh, it happens more and you know you, you invite it a little bit more so true, you know those true. have all been relatively good experiences mm -hmm. um if I can I also I mentioned uh, that experience I had with the cave though this was one we had where it was not quite as welcoming uh presence and it's interesting because I just recently learned um, I heard someone talking about how areas where there's quarries or mines, uh, any sort of man-made disruption of the earth, you can get a real negative energy kind of growing there. Mm -hmm. And so this, uh, this hike we went on, uh, it's just outside of a place uh, just on the edge of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, it's called Canmore. And 
this cave we heard about apparently it was a bunker that was made during the cold war and it was supposed to be like a underground bunker uh, where they're just going to keep documents and things like that and so they made this cave system in the mountainside Goodness. but it turned out there was too much moisture and never would have worked out so it got abandoned so you can take uh, this trail up to it now and you kind of have to know about it because there's a main trail um, that takes you up to these waterfalls, but you got to know about the other trail that takes you up to the cave. Mm -hmm. So we thought, hey, let's go and do this trail. It was the very beginning of April. So there's still some ice and snow around. Uh, so you could hear like our feet crunching in the snow every now and then. And right from the get go, I got kind of an uneasy feeling about this. We're in the mountains frequently and, you know, I'm pretty comfortable with them. I go hiking myself around there. So, you know, you're wary of animals. There's a lot of bears. I've come across a lot of bears and you know, a wolf one time. Um, never anything negative though, but I just felt kind of unease. And the first thing on this whole journey that we noticed is we are looking off uh, down one of the cliff sides towards all these uh, birch stands. And one tree was just uh, rocking back and forth. Now that happens sometimes from wind, but we just found it very odd that it wasn't yeah. windy and this one tree was walk rocking mm. back and forth. You know, whatever, weird things happen. So we continued on the trail and it's a lovely trail. Um, so we finally get up to the, the cave and this was probably the first time in my adult life that I felt fear. I didn't want to go in this cave at all. <laughs> When you went in it, and now I don't go in a lot of caves, so maybe this right. was just because I experienced, but it was so dark. We brought, we just had a tiny little headlamp flashlight in our phone lights, and the darkness just swallowed the light, but it was so silent too. Yeah. You could like feel just like the weight of the mountain on top of you. And my wife was like, this is amazing, let's go. And she's going deeper and deeper. And I had to like will my legs to move. Like every instinct was telling me I should not be here. Oh. I do not want to go further. And so I'm going, I'm going. And it kind of, it leads, it branches off. And you have one area that we went into. And then it branches off to another little area and then around a corner. And something just kept telling me like, don't go around that corner. Yeah. Like don't leave like it I'd never felt that since you know being a kid and being you know afraid in the nighttime but I I was terrified <laughs> so my wife she's like okay no it's it, you know let's go because you know we trust each other and when my gut okay. instinct is telling me you shouldn't be here well we left apparently it, yeah. when you go okay. around to this final cavern someone painted this giant demon on there too or something so it's okay. uh there's a lot of graffiti around because kids will hang out there i guess but yeah so we leave and so the feeling's starting to shake um but it just still felt very strange the whole time and as we we're getting near the end of the trail uh, the bushes directly behind us just go crashing like someone threw a log and the tree arms are still swaying. And so we're like, what was that? I was seeing maybe a tree was held down by a log and I was trying to recreate what might have done this. Mm -hmm. You know, when a squirrel jumps through a tree, you make a noise, you hear it. Mm -hmm. But this was like a crashing of something big, maybe like if it was the size of like a large dog crashing jumping over the trail and into it you couldn't yeah. see anything you know the trees weren't super thick so that spooked us a little bit but again you know you just kind of chalk it up hey this just happened so we keep walking and as i mentioned there's still some ice on the ground and from behind us we heard like the crunch of the ice and my wife jumped around she says she felt like that feeling when you know someone's behind yeah. you like she felt that presence. And when I heard that crunch, like I felt it too. So she jumps around and I turn around and nothing's there, but we are just like all the hairs are standing up on the back of our neck. Mm -hmm. we, we felt this thing behind us. We heard something crunching the ice behind us. And we were like, let's get out of here. Let's go. Let's go. And so we finish uh, the trail crosses uh, kind of a bit of an area. That's kind of like uh, not quite the quarry, but where they, tore apart a lot of the mountainside as well and as soon as we crossed that line like this 
feeling went away. Like it was almost like something was like, it was a final like, yeah, and stay out, you know, like it mm-hmm. was pushing mm-hmm. us to leave. And that was probably the most negative time I had ever spent uh, in the, in the woods. And as I mentioned that area, so there was the cave, but just across um, the road, there's a quarry as well, a pretty big quarry. So um, that was a less than fun time that we had. (laughs) That is very interesting. And I guess, you know, you don't know, um, you said there's a big picture of a a demon and yeah, you know, it's art, people create art and you have kids and metting around and things like that. It's fair enough. But also, you don't know what's taken place in that space. Um, you don't know if mm. anything's been invoked in there. You don't know if if something is using that space, of course. Um, but what you do know is how you feel about it. And you, you've you got to listen, as, as you did, to your instinct in those situations, because it is, it is telling us something. And it could have been anything, really, couldn't it? And if it's something large, obviously, I'm just sort of immediately thinking of something like Bigfoot um yes you know that was going through our minds because we're yeah we're real uh Bigfoot enthusiasts as well but you know my logical brain was saying worst case scenario it's a cougar that's stalking us which is definitely worst case scenario I mean if you've ever been attacked by just a house cat I don't want to get attacked by a cougar (laughs) I'm not really afraid of bears and I'm not really afraid of wolves but I do not want to cross paths with the cougar (laughs) cool so that's a possibility up where you are up where they're yes yes so um but yeah so you know that was that was that was definitely a negative experience but you know for the most part I have many many positive experiences in the woods um yeah as i said especially around these uh, kind of sand hill uh, wetland areas that are around in uh, my province here mm-hmm. um so i just stay very open to it and i try to i actually really hope that i get to see something else one day um you know i am i'm firm in my beliefs i'm firm in my you know energies and the power that I have to affect the world. And um, it just, it does feel like if you could see something again and know that it wasn't just a a trick of your mind or, you know, a heightened state of this or that, like if you could just see it uh, not because I want to show the world, but because I want to show myself that uh, yes, this connection I'm having is real Mm -hmm. and founded Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's really hard to, it's really difficult, because if you if you go out sort of looking, um, then that that's, it, it's hard, it seems to be harder. What what tends to happen is, um, you know, you'll be minding your own business doing something else, and then something will, will happen. But it yes. seems to me that you're third eye is very open if that's what we see these beings with which that that's the kind of the way that I'm thinking about things and I don't know because I I don't have the answers but for me that makes the most sense to me but I think that by connecting in with that that fungus you have as well um and tinderwood tinderwood tinder hoof tinder hoof tinder hoof um I think that you know by connecting in with with that and meditating and just just practicing connecting i think that um you know things may just happen naturally anyway did you find you know when the the cave encounter happened was there stuff going not with you know i'm not asking you to go into any kind of personal details but were there things happening in your life at that time that might have that, that might have explained um... that at all not well actually so we were out there because we were celebrating my 30th birthday had just happened okay. so um you know that was a transition in my life mm. um all in all that whole trip was it was amazing um it was one of the first trips we had where it's just me and my wife again yeah kids stayed at grandma's you know so uh, we yeah. had a week to ourselves and it was actually yeah there wasn't much too much negatively going on in my life no. so I think it was just a case of, you know, we stumbled in somewhere where something just maybe that day just wasn't in the mood. You know, it didn't want us there. Um, it, it was really hard to say. 
Yeah. Um, maybe it doesn't yeah. want anyone there. Like I said, you kind of have mm -hmm. to know that the trail exists. Mm. Uh, it's it's a little difficult to just stumble onto it. Uh, so maybe not too many people go there, and maybe the people that are going there are having similar experiences. Yeah, it would be interesting to find out, wouldn't it? And just touching back as well on your um, you were mentioning about your your child as well. Um, so I mean, this it tends to these kind of abilities or openness to connection tend to run in families from what I am finding and from my own experience as well and um were they getting kind of nightmares or anything like that at, at the time or, or talking to you about things that they'd seen no nothing like no. that my my youngest my uh daughter she has often had um not quite sleep paralysis, maybe like waking dreams. And she says there are times where she feels like she's woken up because she is dropped onto her bed. Yeah. Uh, like she's been lifted and dropped. So uh, nothing, yeah. not too much from the one who actually asked the fairies to come. Right. <laughs> and of course, you know, we make jokes of changelings and all that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, because uh, lots of people do end up putting things like fairy doors in bedrooms. And, you know, I've sort of spoken about this on other episodes as well, that you did exactly the right thing in terms of saying, OK, let's take let's move this space out into the garden. Or if there's a door, let's bring this door out in, into the garden and, and have a place there for them to um to connect with I know you know this I'm kind of only saying it for for other people that might be <laughs> yes. you know watching and listening and that might be thinking of uh you know creating something in bedrooms you're absolutely right let's have somewhere safe outside um yeah, yes. for them to be <laughs> because as we've all learned um it does bring activity into the house then but even yeah. even I mean even when you were talking about the cave there, the, I could sense something in here. It's funny, when I'm speaking to people about sort of slightly darker stuff, I always end up getting a lot of activity in here. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. It doesn't usually happen with light. It's always the kind of the more kind of pokey stuff makes something something around. So anyway. Always it's tend to your mindset that. is opening up to that. Uh, that feeling and that you know yeah. that that flow um that's a word we like to use a lot uh, around here is you know the flow uh whatever you want to call that uh you know inspiration of Alwyn or you know of a god or a goddess uh, we just call it the flow you know and we can tell when we're we're on the flow and we're not on the flow and actually um a lot of like what you've been introducing your uh, episodes with lately is talking about like you know not denying a lot of truth to ourselves and using this time we're in this transition time and you know i feel it you must feel it you talk about it a lot sure. and you know it, it is a lot like on a river you know you have to trust it and you have to just let go because if you're trying to swim against it uh you're not with the flow okay. and i find a lot of times when this negativity is happening it's when we're kind of out of sync and pushing against it and you know, around here, same thing, like, uh, sometimes we think we see things out of the corners of our eyes, shadows. Um, my son said one time he thought I was in the backyard because he saw someone walk, like a shadow walk across the yard, but I was in. So um, definitely, yeah, it seems we can open our mindset to that. Like you said, the more pokey stuff and mm. it, it becomes more prevalent. <laughs> Definitely. And it's not to say that it's, you know, um, we get these feelings. It's not to say that it's a an evil energy or anything like that. It can just be, you know, like you say, with nature, things can happen. Um, you know, trees can fall down or, um, you know, um, wind can 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 damage properties. But, but it's not a purposeful thing. It's just, as you say, it's just nature doing its thing and I guess sometimes it helps to to know that side of it too you know there's there's a richness in that too it's not to say that it's um that it's a negative experience even if we get a bit frightened of something I think we're so quick to become very fearful of nature itself aren't we unless it's kind of in a, a, a 
tied up in a pretty picture box type situation where there's always happy endings nature just is and and life just is and I think that if we can kind of embrace that and um as you say just kind of go with the flow with that then we just seem, seem, seem to get on a lot better in life really I think but it but it is hard and I have been talking a lot about that recently and um I think we're all feeling it I think we're all feeling yes it, uh, <laughs> in our own ways but, uh, yeah so yeah um, hearing that has definitely helped with uh you know, making me take some extra steps in life right now, which has been really great. And honestly, you know, just I've been able to really recharge my battery, uh, just being able to, you know, be out in the garden again. Um, we we unfortunately get a lot of winter where I'm from. So our growing season, you know, three months if we're lucky. Uh, so there's a lot of darkness. Uh, so I, I spend the most time I can outside because I just, that's when I feel the most connected and kind of how I mentioned before, just, I've really been growing this connection with plants. We make jokes that, you know, you start getting older, suddenly start bird watching, you know, you mushroom forage, but (laughs) honestly it's, it's been amazing. And it ties back to that knowing things when you you don't just see the birds as just uh objects that are in a screen of life it's you know that's a bohemian waxwing there's a robin there's a purple finch like when you start to know the world just comes so much alive and Uh it has to do with just everything and so when when you're open to it it makes the world so much of a better place it really does thank you and thanks for that reminder um, I'm very inspired by the way that you're living your life and uh, it sounds idyllic. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and, and keep me posted. Um, you know, it, I'd love to know what happens to that space, whether, I don't know, could the community kind of rise up and ask whatever the equivalent of your local council is to do something about protecting it or... Is that just not? Uh, I'm not really sure. You know, it's something we've been meaning to check in there. We're like, hey, maybe we should just, uh, maybe we should just sneak in one day. <laughs> They'll camp out near the area and then go and check out the area to see how it's going. But um, I, I think that just it's such a strong energy there that maybe even if they had plans to tear down all of those forest paths, that something in them would stop them because. Yeah. Uh, they'd realize just what a beautiful resource it is and we hope so, yeah. you know yeah and and there's many like that around so you know sometimes if something gets uh, taken away you just got to persevere and trust uh in the flow <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yes let's do that um i'll but join yeah. i join with you in that <laughs> and uh <laughs> okay. yeah this has been yeah. really great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, like I said, I always so love talking to people that are of like mindset. And uh, I hope that uh, the rest of the summer treats you really well. Yes, you too. Enjoy where you are too. And do keep me posted on your experience out there and, and how it's all going. Yes, absolutely. I'll have to send you some pictures of uh, the pond as well. <laughs> I would love to see that. And your enclosure as well. I'm really interested in that. So just just, just to recap that um, we were talking about cats and how it's hard because we love having cats, but then they go and kill wildlife. So an enclosure is a good way of, um, you know, meeting everybody's needs. And uh, Absolutely. You know, yeah, if you're privileged wildlife. enough to have the space, then... Yeah get those critters out there in the safest manner possible true true okay all right thanks and yeah speak speak soon then thank you very much all right you have a good one Big thanks to our guest Paul for sharing his story and the video version of this episode will be on YouTube in around about a week's time. I really enjoyed hearing the way he described his intimate relationship with the environment. His encounter is very interesting as it's similar to that of many people that I speak to and they wonder to themselves, did I just see that or did I make it up? Some of the giveaways that you have had an encounter are the physical responses in your body. Paul describes the hair standing up on the back of his neck and the innate sense that something was going on. 
Even though he was used to the wild creatures of the forests, coyotes and bears, he recognised this feeling as something else and that it felt more intense than what he was used to experiencing. It was unknown to him. When he sees the being, and I'm calling these tree folk as I don't have any particular reference for them, although they sound connected with the tree or the wood area itself, he blinks and asks himself, am I actually seeing this? Many of us can recognise this feeling from our own encounters. Initially, he's just enjoying the moment and communing with the space when he first enters the forest and he's walking around. So he's relating to it, perhaps on its own terms, if you will. In these sorts of circumstances, you start to feel yourself as part of that place and you start to relax. But when in this natural relaxed state, he notices the being, his mind kicks in and questions and it disappears before his eyes. It's like he's jumped back into his mind and from that place he can no longer perceive it in its natural state. Afterwards he goes back to test whether it's the light but deep inside he knows something has taken place and returns to share that moment with his wife. I thought it was great that the tinderhoof fungus was the perfect size for his hands. It's like a beautiful coincidence and of course we know that there are no such things as coincidences. Paul's other experience is interesting too. As a flip side to the beauty and wonder we can feel somewhere, we can also appreciate those times when we enter into a space where we are either not welcome or it is not safe to be there for some reason. We can't explain it or put it into words sometimes, but it's an undeniable knowingness. Paul said that every instinct told him he should not be there. It might not make sense outwardly, but you must act upon feelings like that every time. There's a difference between general anxiety and constant fear and the sort of awareness that descends and makes itself known in your body when you encounter a space like this. It's animalistic. Trust it. You have all the answers within you. Paul and his wife have a close relationship and when he said he needed to leave, she immediately responded and trusted his instincts alongside him. My ears pricked up at the point where he said he hadn't felt like that since being a kid. I guess perhaps a sense of that vulnerability of being at the mercy of a world that you don't yet have experience of, as you do as a child. The aspect of the tree changing form is also fascinating. A similar shape shift took place in episode 51, the Brazilian Ent. There are many other encounters where the being has an ability to shape shift. If you'd like to hear more of these, I read some similar modern day accounts in the bonus episode related to this episode. You'll find that on Patreon. In his book, The Secret Commonwealth, written in 1692, the Reverend Robert Kirk himself described the good people, as they are sometimes called, as having light changeable bodies that are so pliable through the subtleties of the spirits that agitate them that they can make them appear and disappear at pleasure. And later, William Butler Yeats noted that many poets and all mystic and occult writers in all ages and countries have declared that behind the visible are chains on chains of conscious beings who are not of heaven but of the earth, who have no inherent form but change according to their whim or the mind that sees them. If it is our own mind that changes and effectively blocks our ability to see them, then it follows that we should be able to reverse that and open our minds. Of course, there are ways in which we can alter our mind states, and they do include plant medicines, but a tried and tested, freely available way is through meditation. It doesn't need to be an eyes-closed traditional method of meditation, but simply try focusing on the beauty of a tree, the busy goings-on of an insect, a bird song, the breeze through your hair. Really sense into it, feel how your body responds. There really is beauty everywhere and thresholds into the other world. But the means to open these doors are ultimately within you. In order to unlock these, you must first know yourself. That's the first step on this path. And there are many others who are walking the same journey at the moment and we build in ever greater numbers. Step forward with an open heart and always remain curious. <laughs>